Hello, good evening. Welcome to the LFC Day Trippers. It is a full-time Reds after it finished. Who the hell do we even play? Aston Villa 1, <laughs> Liverpool, th Liverpool 3. First game back in the Premier League. Uh, I'm Matt. With me tonight is Kev. Kev, the football's back. The proper football. Uh, and breathe. And breathe. Yeah. That was, that was a mad one. That was an absolute mad one. Uh, given the form that Villa were in under Emery, uh, that was a that's a huge three points, you know. Given the context of everything that's happened today as well, with Spurs dropping points and exactly. Manchester United still to United still to play, you know that's the start of clawing clawing point clawing points back. Um, yeah, that leaves us. Uh, it was, it was huge. What, five po five points off fourth with the game in hand. So yeah, and and that's all you can do, you know, is win your games and see where it takes you, and you have to start somewhere. And that's, I think, three wins on the bounce now in the league for us. So we're doing all we can to try to eliminate the first half, the first probably 10 games of the season, and just chalk up some wins now. That's all we can do is just chalk off wins, get through these games as healthy as possible. And that's, you know, see where it, that's what it says, see where it takes us. And yep. based on parts of that performance today, you'd be really content and happy with it. Certain parts not so much, but credit where it's due. Villa came out the blocks fire in the second half, and they were they were tough, not, tough not to handle at times. But we got through it, killed it off, got the three points, and onwards to the next one. Absolutely, I mean it's uh, there's no shortage of talking points for us to go through in that game. You know, there's uh, plenty to talk about all the players, but. Uh, Bonus points to Chris Golding. Eagle-eyed here says, Kev's been down the printers for a backdrop. <laughs> yeah, one, uh, my daughter decided to uh, buy me a Christmas present. And um, this, well, I opened it up yesterday morning. I, I honestly thought she bought me a pool cue, which is like, it came in this package and it looked like a pool cue. And I thought, oh, that's an interesting one. Opened it up, pulled it out. And she's like, yeah. She said, look, I'm sick of seeing you with just a pair of curtains behind you. <laughs> have that instead so i thought fair enough delighted yeah, with life that's, my wife uh hung up the uh the liverpool scarf and then i hung up my montreal Canadiens for the same reason yeah like can't, <laughs> can't just be having a plain background if you're on here more than just once or twice sort of thing so well let's uh let's get into it what did you what did you think of the starting lineup kev pretty much what everybody predicted allison trent robo virgil matip henderson fabinho tiago in the midfield ox out on the left with darwin and mo I think the only decision there to be made was Carvalho and Ox. And to be fair, when we were doing the preview to this one, I, I wanted to Ox to play um, purely and simply because he can drop into midfield and he gives you that bit of experience. Um, I think Carvalho is better off the bench, personally. I think he's still finding his feet at the club. And Ox, on the strength of what he did against City, that ball he put through for Darwin to get him away for the second goal, so he's got that in his locker, you know, that uh, bit of vision. And he's done ev he's done everything right to try to get back and to try and get back fit. And him off the left is a, is it a decent option. The rest of the side, unfortunately, picks itself. And that yeah. is a problem. Um, we were here a few years ago, you know, when we could nail down the starting 11 all the time. And where the gap was so big between the starting 11, 12, and the rest, this time, it's just a case of injuries. And the injuries are killing us, man. And it's a conversation for another night, obviously. But the squad needs help if they want to, if we need to get to the champ, if we, to, we're to get to the Champions League, they need help in getting there. And the club have got to dig them out and help them out. And it's as simple as that. But happy enough with the 11, I thought it was good enough. Yeah. The only thing I felt was I felt that the win had to come from the 11. I didn't think yeah. there was going to be much options off the bench to affect change if we had to chase it. So I felt that if we were going to win it, it was going to be the 11 that started, had to go and win it and come back from there, you know, and, and just see it out from where we were. But they did the job, you know. I, I mean, it was a, a crazy start to the game because, <laughs> you know, at the start, it was like end to end. Villa had three or four real good half chances. They were 
never really clear. None of the sides really had any clear cut chances that you'd say, you know, horrible misses. But yeah. there were half there were half chances on from both sides. And if it was two two after ten minutes, you'd be like, "Wow, this is some watch." If you're a neutral, but biting every nail you had in your head, <laughs> you know, as a fan, yeah, you're it... like, "Oh my god, what's going on here? Someone get a grip of this," you know. But yeah, I mean, first couple minutes, Allison plays a long ball to Robertson, who puts a delicious looking cross in for Darwin Nunez, who for some reason decides to throw a dummy that causes Tyrone Mings to just smash into Robin Olsen. Uh, I mean, brilliant play if you're trying to get, you know, players taken out of the game by having a full speed collision, but uh, kind of a baffling decision to not try to get a foot on that and redirect that ball into the net. It was mad. And the thing is, I was watching uh, on um, with uh, Michael Owen and Ian Wright were in the, in the, doing the halftime stuff. And like him or not, there is no one better than Michael Owen to analyze strikers. Nobody. He's brilliant at it. And he was sat there, he was like, I don't know why on earth he did that. Nobody could have made it, nobody co- could have made a call. Yeah. He was all he had to do was just clip it with his right with his left foot. Whether it was a case he thought I can't get my foot around it. So I'm just going to dummy it. I don't know. Maybe it came too quick at him. But at the same time, it caused chaos. And throughout that first half, that's what he did. He caused chaos. And he's the most frustrating player to watch at times. Because there were times, especially in the second half, where I was roaring at the telly for him to stay onside. You know? Yes. And I, it was so frustrating to watch him. Desperate to get on the end of something, but over eager, you know, brain not working as fast as his legs were working. Uh, yeah. It's frustrating beyond belief, but rough diamond for sure. You know, I worry about him when he's hiding in games and not getting chances and shying away from chances. He's not doing that. He's he's getting half chances. And on another night, he's got, he scores a hat trick in 30 minutes. But we're going to, if we're going to get to where we need to get to, he's going to start to have to start banging goals. And that's yeah. just, the facts of it you know we could yeah especially with our injuries in the forward line like you know yeah. it's it's not like we can call on Diogo Jota to come off the bench and score one in every two I mean Chris Brack points out that he's got nine goals and 20 you know in all competitions yeah. this year so you know one and two is a sign of a pretty good quality striker at the end of the day you're scoring one and yeah. two goals so it's not that he's not scoring goals it's just he seems to get into so many situations that you you're like you're almost expecting him to score. Like, you, you, like imagine if Erling Holland got into the goal scoring situations that Darwin Nunes got in. He'd have about 47 goals this year yeah. with the way he's able to convert. But I mean, that first one where he dummies the ball. I mean, you might find it a baffling decision, but at the end of the day, we score from that. So you know, we eventually, to score me, that's it. yeah. To me, that's no harm, no foul. Oh yeah, you get away with you know? it, but at the same time, look at what how that goal came about. That ball from Trent. To see it in the first place and have the audacity to play that ball with the outside of your foot into Robbo's path, path perfectly and Robbo to weight that ball perfectly across the box onto Salah, tap it in. It was a beautiful goal from start to finish. It really was. But it was all about that pass from Trent on the outside of his foot into Robbo's path. It's just pure, pure it was outrageous yeah. that, he even, yeah, it- that he even saw it. It's one of those passes where you say if Kevin De Bruyne did it, they'd they'd do 15 minutes on the post game about it, sort of thing, like mm-hmm. just a, a truly outrageous pass. Amy I mean, Trent, I thought I thought Trent had a fantastic first half. Like it yeah, was in the Telegram group. There's a few people firing back and forth that some of the players that we had kind of accused of hiding in the first you know half of the season of Fabinho, Van Dijk, and Trent all look to be re-energized and back to their best. And to me, Trent was the absolute pinnacle of that. And uh, like I, I sent a message, you know, like it just seemed like Robbo had so much space down the left wing, even though they were doubling up on that side, because it's clear that Emery doesn't, you know, didn't trust Ashley Young to be able to do a job against Robertson and Chamberlain, that they were throwing McGinn out there to double up on him. It When Trent had the ball, he, if he got his head up and looked, 
Robertson just kept making these straight runs and no, it wasn't seen. And he'd reload and he'd make another run and another run, and another run. Yeah. And Trent found him a couple of times. And it, that was good to see. Cause that's the sort of stuff that we were missing in that first half of the season. The first couple of months was, yeah. it seemed like Trent wasn't even trying to play some of those balls or if he was, they were miles, miles off. So, I mean, that pass will, that, that pass will do him all the world of good. And for Andy Robertson, it has to be said, that makes him the all-time Premier League assist leader for defenders with 54, overtaking yeah. the Dickensian shipmate that is Leighton Baines. It's mad, really, when you think about it, because I remember, look, Leighton Baines is a really good, solid fullback and one that should have left Everton long before he did. Yeah. Or, long, you know, a, lo a long time. But same as Seamus Coleman, same kind of thing, same kind of vibes. But he took virtually almost all of their set pieces at one stage. Yeah. And you think that Robertson still has probably another three or four years to go at Liverpool, has overtaken him already. It's mad. The fact that Mo Salah has equaled Michael Owen's record of away Premier League goals for the club. He's the joint highest away goal scorer at the club with Michael Owen at 55. And he's just going to shoot through that. You know, he's going to shoot through that. And the next person who's going to chase down Mo Salah's records, I can't wait to watch him. He's going to be a special, special yeah. talent. You know, but yeah, it's, it, it, it's one of those. But Robertson was really good breaking down the left. And it was telling probably that it was his Scottish teammate trying to, you know, and he's and he's really good, mate. You know, they're really good yeah. mates, a rap, little rap face boy. And... It was just a case of like who's got to run out of Iron Brew first. They were, they were running legs off each other all game long, and a lot of the joy that he had was probably created by the space that Chamberlain vacated at the right time, and that's kind of good, solid. You know, it's just a bit of intelligent wing play to leave the space for someone else to play in, and younger kids, my younger players probably aren't as game streetwise as that. That stuff that comes with experience. But as I said, I mean, it was 1-0 and we were ticking along. Happy go lucky. Thinking we're well in control of this. Then there was a couple, there was one ball over the top that got in behind Trent. That was the one thing I suppose with Trent in the first half. He was so aggressive on the press that if Villa could play the one past in midfield mm -hmm. and play one over the top in behind Matip, that was on for them. And in Ollie Watkins, they had willing runners all game. Yeah, you know, he was a willing runner to give the give our two centre backs plenty of things to worry about all night long. But other than that, you're looking at the first half thinking, all right, happy, happy enough. They're, you're giving up half chances, but you're away from home and the Rokers Villa who were really up for it. And but you're I thought I felt we were in fairly we we're fairly well in control of it all, to be honest. Yeah, it's. I felt what it took us you? probably about 15, 20 minutes to really settle into the game because I made a note at 16 yeah. minutes. Uh, that's when Watkins had a diving header that he put right into the ground was an easy save for Allison. But I said, like, that's three or four chances that they've had now. Because, I mean, just before that, they had a chance where, like, Leon Bailey had a terrible game. He had a couple yeah. of chances, and he just could not make any sort of contact with the ball. He had two or three just straight air shots on the ball in our box where he should have at least been – you know, forcing the keeper to make a save. But after those early wobbles, we really seemed to slow down into the game. Uh, one thing I thought, I thought Ollie Watkins did a really good job against Joel Matip in terms of pinning him down and providing Villa with a long ball outlet. And Joel was having a tough time kind of winning that physical battle with him. Uh, he, did, mm. he did a good job because, again, he was so, like, Matip was so isolated with Trent going forward and Joel having to go out and cover all that space that it gave Watkins a lot of space to work into. And they got a lot of joy out of that for us. But, I mean, 21 minutes, I, I put a star beside this, so I made sure to bring it up. We had a counter press where Trent did a full robo. You know, he lost the ball. He chased one guy down. They passed it back. <laughs> he kept going. He kept going. He kept going. And it ends up with Olsen screwballing it out for us for a throw in. And it's just yeah. like – I love that. Exact, it was the exact opposite of what we'd been pissed off at Trent about in the opening months of the season was it didn't look like he cared. He wasn't willing to run and put in the hard yards. And that was Robbo that, you know, that was mm. Robbo against Man City where you're going, what the hell? He just keeps going, reminded and going, me, and going. Reminded me of Alberto Moreno doing the same thing. <laughs> uh, when he, Alberto Moreno did the same thing when he, he not long joined the club, but he, I think it was against Spurs. It might, I might be wrong, 
but he he ran like a lunatic. Yeah. And just ran across, chased the ball all the way across to the back four, back to the keeper, and the keeper hoofed it. Love seeing that out of a player. You can only probably do that once. Once in a game before you burst your lungs off. But I was <laughs> roaring at the telly at that. I was absolutely yeah. delighted. I'm glad you brought that up, to be honest. I was roaring at the telly for that. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's the sort of, like, you know, Trent gets absolute pelters for his inability to defend. So I, uh, being a completely, <laughs> completely unabashed, biased Liverpool fan, I like to bring up and make sure to mention the times when he does actually the correct things and the right job. Uh, yeah. I, we, we got our second goal. Uh, where do I have this down here? That's 37, I think. Oh, oh, why did I get that? Oh, yeah, right. Uh, Mo's goal brings him level with Kenny Dog Leash. Somebody did mention that here. Yeah. Or, yeah. So, I mean, esteemed, esteemed company I mean, for Mo Salah. And I mean, there's, again, this has been mentioned many times before. Mo knows this. This is, yeah. he he's going to get in the mix zone and there's not going to be a, a journalist that's going to surprise him with this statistic. This seems like something that Mo Salah knew damn well that he was one goal behind Kenny Dog Leash. <laughs> he's going to know when he goes past him. Hopefully in our next game as well. I tell you too. what, I guarantee you, Mo Salah is an office at home, and on that in that office on a board, he's got the list of records that he's he's knocking off, and that is, I've never seen a player more self obsessed with breaking records than yeah. him, because anytime he mentions it's mentioned to him in interviews, he's like, yeah, I know, and this is the next one. Yep. Uh, yep. He, exactly. It's very. It's not very. British, it's very, it's a very American sports kind of thing. You see that in NBA a lot. You see it in yeah. NFL a hell of a lot. And I was, I look at him and I'm just thinking, for someone who was so self-obsessed, and he was selfish for so long in his Liverpool career. He's not this season. In fairness to him, he's very much a team, a team player now. But he's still knocking off these records. He's still getting these, getting his fair share of goals. And he still gets in great positions. The position he got himself in for the first goal, do you know what I mean? That's a proper centre-forward striker's position to be in. And to go past Kenny Dalglish, I mean, granted, players are playing a lot more football now, even at club level, than they ever did back then. But at the same time, when you look at the calibre of players that surrounded Kenny Dalglish for his entire Liverpool career, and he was there for a long time as a player. Precisely. And it was in a winning Liverpool side all the way through his club career. He's, and Mo's done it in six years. He's an absolute freak. You know, the Premier League, he's, in Premier League terms, he's up there with the very, very best. You know, he's yeah. right up there with the very, very best. And the thing is, he's not as, as aesthetically pleasing as a Thierry, Thierry Henry, but he's as ruthless as any striker that has ever played in this league. You know, and the thing is, if he was as aesthetically pleasing as a Leo Messi, as a Thierry Henry, he'd get a lot more credit than what he what he actually gets because he he actually he looks like a player who can't dribble, who struggles with his first touch. And he just comes all the time, but he's not. He just takes so many close touches with the ball. That's why defenders struggle to get it off him. He takes so many close control touches that draws fouls. And it, it doesn't look good on the eye. You know, whereas if you've got a, a winger who long stride, who just silky smooth, goes past a player with a trick yeah. or whatever, that's, that's not him. He's different. But, man, he is he's a freak. He's an absolute freak. You run out of superlatives for the guy. You really do. Yeah. Well, I mean, we're gonna we're gonna need to start building up a list of superlatives for him because Mo Salah is the type of player that we're gonna be talking about as Liverpool fans in twenty years, and you know, telling the telling yeah, the new generation of fans of you don't understand how good he was, and it's things like passing Kenny Dalglish and passing Steven Gerrard is those are those are the hurdles you have to overcome to get on that you know Mount Rushmore all time eleven sort of thing, and he just yeah. keeps ticking them off and. Yeah, I, I agree. He's got one of those pull up printout things in his bedroom and it's got it's got rush written on it, you know, with a big circle around it. And mm. hey, I'm I'm all for it. If he wants to try to break that record, it means he's gonna score a shit ton of goals for Liverpool. And I am a a a okay with that. But uh you mentioned you mentioned the uh, second goal. Another another set second piece goal, goal, yeah. Yeah, another goal comes. Should it have been a should, should it have been an own goal? Should it have been an own goal? 
I saw one angle that certainly made it look like an own goal. And if an own goal means that the assist for fantasy goes to Virgil instead of Mo, because I took Mo out of my team, I think it should be an own goal. I think uh, I, I think it should be an own goal. I mean, it, it serves me right either which way for not having faith and dropping the Liverpool players out of my team. But uh, United and Chelsea's upcoming schedule was just too juicy to not load up with them because they've got some duds that they're playing. But uh, yeah. Great control by Mo. I mean, it goes to what you were saying about him not being a selfish player. A selfish player there tries to swivel on that and just blast a shot in net. Yeah. But he takes that takes that extra touch and he lays it off to Virgil van Dijk, who I couldn't believe didn't find a way of lampooning that well over the bar and into the crowd because that seems to be kind of his go-to when it comes to shooting it. But you now, nice left-footed uh, shot. Yeah, it takes a little bit of a deflection, but Virgil gets the second goal and yeah. I thought that was I thought that was curtains. I thought that was done and dusted this game. Yeah, I did as well. I thought you had another. Why do we have another five six minutes to go until halftime? I thought if we can get a third one here and kill it off completely, you know, and just kill, kill just break their hearts. Really, going into halftime, absolutely break their hearts. But to be fair to Villa, in that first half, they they had enough half chances. Even you, you know you go in you down two 0 and you say okay some. Get one, you might get two. But I thought if we could get a third, that would finish it completely. But I was the same as you at halftime, 2-0. I was delighted with it. You know, we'd rode our, rode our luck when we needed to, but we were clinical at the same time and took our chances when they when they came to us. And like I said, Darwin had enough half chances in that half to knock in another couple, you know, and they weren't yep. exactly bad chances. You know, there were bad decisions. It was bad decision making on the type of finish that he should have used. You know, there was one where he should have maybe tried to shoot with the outside of his right foot and go across the keeper, at least force a save, you know, instead of trying to blow the back of the ball off. And he did it again in the second half when he was 1v1 coming in off of his left onto his right foot. And it was screaming out to be curled in with his right foot. And he just tried to leather the back of the ball again. And it's a combination of bad decision making, mm. poor finishing choices, and confidence. But he doesn't lack the hunger to get in those positions either. So there's still hope for him. You know, well, or it, the attributes to get into those positions, because a lot yeah, of his chances it. come from being just dead quick. You know, mm. it's another striker wouldn't get like Bobby Firmino wouldn't get into some of the positions that Darwin Nunes finds himself in just because he's blessed with such, such raw pace to do it. Uh, I'd be interested to see what his XG uh, looks like for that game, because oh. you said like it, it wasn't like he missed absolute sitters where if you're going any... like. Like, how did you possibly, possibly miss that? But yeah, yeah. I mean. Uh, LFC Aaron had said there that DVD looked like he was back to his old self tonight. And I mean, just before halftime, after we got the second goal, they had a good break and Virgil just came flying through, cleaned it up. No nonsense. Like exactly how you expect Virgil van Dyke to play. Like uh, I thought, I thought Virgil had a, had a pretty good game today. Yeah. His XG was 1.14. Well, all right. Well, he should you, he he should have had at least one, if not two, you know, but it's for me it was the the one that came over the top that he just volleyed straight on his left foot and just took the straight volley chris was i was chatting with chris during the game and he was adamant he should have took a touch i looked at him and thought if he tries to take that down the keeper comes and smothers him straight away but ian yeah. right at half time described how he would have done it that he'd have taken the touch on his knee to kill it yeah, and then take a touch yeah. to go. Then yeah, then take a touch to go around the keeper and bang. And you're listening to him, and I can picture Ian Wright doing that in my head. You know what I mean? It's just that that's the kind of. I suppose if you're in the studio, you can, it's easier. But at the same time, it's Ian Wright <laughs> saying it, so it's like, yeah, he probably yeah. has done it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, it, but, it's it's different than just some guy sitting on his couch saying the exact same thing. Yeah, that's, exactly. That's Ian yeah. Wright. He actually yeah. knows. He, I mean, as a Liverpool fan, I was wondering why he didn't just try to like juggle it with his shoulder and go around him like Luis Suarez would have done, sort of thing. You know, that's always an option as well. I would have yeah. thought at the but World the more... Cup, Louis would have passed along some of that wisdom. Well, it'll come. It'll come for him. But we go into halftime 2 0, and you're thinking, happy out. 
plain sailing. Yeah. We'll just see this 45 out, rest some legs if we can. And if we nick one on the break, fine. Because you knew Villa were going to come. You know, yeah. you knew they'd take I, some risks. But at the half, I didn't, I couldn't think of any of our players that had a poor half. I thought all of our players played well. Like I wrote down after we got the second goal that Chamberlain was doing great. Like mm. he was doing nothing spectacular. He wasn't doing the things that we remember Chamberlain doing for us. And I don't yeah. know if he can be that type of player anymore. That pick the ball up, drive it from midfield, you know, blasting shots from the outside of the box. But he knows the system. He knows the role that he needs to play. He knows the pressing triggers and everything like that. And I thought that all worked really good in the first half. And that was one of the things I was saying when people were bringing up that, you know, Darwin Nunes is shite and he can't finish his breakfast and things like that. There are other parts to a game than just scoring goals. And I yeah. thought like how Darwin slotted in with the press from the front, he seemed more at home with it. He seemed to understand his role in that team pressing the team defense system a lot better. And there were lots of times where Fabinho, you know, for the in the past couple of months when Fabinho has been just looking absolutely miles off it, he's been trying to put out fires 15 yards inside our own half. He was putting out fires today on the edge of their box. You know, yeah. that's how effective our press was in the first half was that we had all the forwards up and the midfielders were all up and we're winning the ball back or forcing them to lump it long. And then Virgil and uh, Matthew are winning easy headers. And we're getting the ball and recycling it over again. And, ah, man, I, I went through halftime. I was sailing. Like, the Premier League's back. We're looking great. It's 2 nothing. This is going to be an easy coast into the second half. And holy shit, did the wheels come off. It yeah, was, it – seconds into the second half that Ollie Watkins has the ball in the back of our net? Yeah, and, and in fairness, that was a warning shot because that ball is on all the time. And all it took was one clever back heel from, I think it was Bundia, to play it into yeah. Douglas Louise, maybe, and the one-touch pass into Watkins. And he was offside, but it was close. And on another day, Trent doesn't hold his run. Or someone doesn't hold their run. Or Watkins times it better. It was a good finish. And you thought, okay. But and that and that got the, the whole end up. That got the villa crowd up. And that got the villa players up. And they saw, okay, we can get one. And from then until the time that they did score, it was coming. You know, it was just it was a case of when. You know, not not if it was when. And Credit where it's due, they were really good. They came out the blocks at the start of the second half, and they did. They were relentless. You know, we didn't help ourselves uh, in managing that situation better, holding the ball in better areas of the pitch, trying to take the sting out of the game, kill the crowd. We were two 0 up. We were. You'd had your warning shot, and it needed senior players to just come up with something. You know, you have to can't rely on instructions from the side and they generally do they they generally come up with ways of managing in-game situations pretty well but Villa just kept coming and coming and it was an almost identical goal to Harry Kane's goal earlier with the um, header from Watkins that went straight back to where it came from and uh, really good ball took massive completely out of the game you could yeah. argue Trent could be closer but you're nitpicking. Sometimes you just got to hold your hands up and say, yeah, that's a really good cross. And that's a really good header into the side. Yeah, it... Not a thing Allison could do about it. And the thing is about the cross, the cross was flat. So even if Trent saw the cross coming, I don't think he could get across to do anything about it. It was that fast. The, the, the yeah. pace was on the cross. So it's just one of the, and it was like, they could try that cross 10 times in a game and hit it once. That was just the one time that they hit it. It, it, those kind of crosses usually tend to go high, white, and handsome, or they get under hit and they get cleared. You know, you'll see yeah. that them get cleared almost all the time. But they got that one absolutely perfect, and straight on, straight on the nut, and bang, two one, and the nerves come back for me. <laughs> yeah, first. well, I mean, I have three notes down in the first three minutes of the second half. Watkins in, tucks away, offside from far. A minute later, McGinn, free header, back post. Easy save for Allison. We have no defense. 48th minute, Buendia gets a cutback from Dean, puts it wide into the side netting. I mean, in the first three minutes of the second half, they had 
three half chances. You know, one of them's offside, so that doesn't really count. And you know, Mo has a breakaway. He seems to stumble over his own feet. To me, when I watch that one where he was loose, I think he gets his head up and he sees Darwin steaming in and he's looking to cut that ball back across and he just can't sort his feet out. And then it doesn't matter because they go up the other end a couple minutes later and they put the ball in. I, I don't put a lot of blame on Trent for that one. I think Trent looks and sees that Matt Tip has Watkins and Watkins yeah. just drifts off and gives himself that little bit of space. He falls into that pocket between Matt Tip and yeah. Trent. Great it, was only a couple of, it, was, it was only a couple of feet as well. That's all it was. Yeah. It was like ar an arm's length. Yeah, but well, because like you were saying, the, the, the cross was so flat and so perfect that it can just go over Matt Tip's head, and it's yeah. there for him to just absolutely plant it away. And good finish for him. He probably deserved it. And, and he, he deserved was, it for sure. Yeah, yeah, and Watkins probably deserved it because he, he was bright and lively. Like, he never really stopped running for Villa in the whole game. So, I mean, that's, that's good for him to get that, considering that on my feed of Jim Beglin and Seb Hutchinson, they were talking about – or no, it might have been Michael Owen at halftime saying that he's just not a good striker. You know, he's not a good finisher. And I'm like, geez, that's that's a bit harsh. <laughs> like the, the guy scored a hat trick against Liverpool. Yeah, but I get where Owen is coming from. The, the thing is with Ollie Watkins, he's been in the league for a while, you know, and he's been at Villa for a for a few years now. Um, he's the kind of striker that needs plenty of chances to get his one. Um, but I don't know. I think if if you're talking about Darwin Nunes being at Liverpool as long as Watkins is at Villa and you're still talking about the same issues, yeah, That's I think there's a real problem. You know, he's only been at Darwin's only been at the club what a few months and yeah. Raw doesn't come close to covering it. Whereas with Watkins, he's he's at the right club for him. This I and no disrespect to Villa, I think Villa are a good club and I think they're a good side. And Watkins is a good striker for them, in the same way as saying Ivan Tony is a good striker for Brentford. God, he's kind nowhere of, that, close to Ivan Tony, though. I think no, I think he is. I think he's well capable of being in that level. I think he's capable. Of, he's definitely a striker that's capable of getting double figures. And I think he'll end, he'll end the season with double figures, in the same way as Tony would. So it's that kind of like 12, 13 goals in the league, we, season in, season out. There's nothing wrong with that. Pl plenty. Of, Plenty of people have gone on to make really good careers out of being that kind of striker, but I think yeah, Wolves and Southampton, Wolves and Southampton would trade their back teeth for a striker that could score exactly. twelve or thirteen goals. But I honestly, I honestly, I honestly think that if Danny Ings was five years younger and had the same levels of fitness and reliability as Nolly Watkins, Danny Ings would be starting every game without a shadow of doubt. Danny Ings is a much better striker, much better. Yeah. Far more clinical yeah, finisher. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Jonathan here. And we're getting on to it. Good subs from Klopp. Uh, when they scored, they got control of the game again. So, yeah, 65th minute, we saw Harvey Elliott and Abby Keita come on for Thiago and Chamberlain. Uh, Chamberlain, to me, was totally anonymous in the second half. For as good as I yeah. thought he played in his role in the first half, second half, he just looked completely <clears throat> out of it. Thiago seemed like a managing minutes kind of thing because we know how yeah. important he is for our midfield. So those two changes worked for me. And I mean, immediately the game calmed down. And that was it did, yeah. in retros in retrospect, that was kind of the end of their push. Is once I, we made the changes, we got some fresh legs in. We seemed to rejig. I think we kind of went to a bit of a four four two. Yeah. Yeah, we did. Uh, uh you can see Na Nabby going into that like double six with uh Fabinho. Uh, yeah, the left sided the left sided six with Elliot outside of him, yeah. and then Henderson when he was still on the pitch out beside Fabinho, just to give us a few more numbers because we were like I thought our midfield bossed the first half. I thought I thought Henderson, Fabinho, and Thiago just looked fantastic, and then the second half was just like where did they go? Where did they go? So <laughs> you know, bringing those changes in and kind of rejigging the formation, putting an extra man in there, it it helped us put our foot on the ball, and I mean from there yeah. it it really killed the game off. I think. Uh, Chris saying there that Elliot and Nabby did nothing. Only thing I can remember is a mad ball Elliot tried to play and Nabby gave away two fouls. The thing is, what they did do is they got their foot on the ball and they broke up play. They didn't allow Villa in at in for easier chances. And that's what the game needed. It needed energy in the middle of the park. Uh, by, 65, by the time they came on, Ox and Thiago's race was run. And Villa were getting too many runners off of him, off their shoulders. And that didn't happen with Naby. 
He's never, he's not, he wasn't going to give you that lung bursting run beyond forwards or take the ball 20 yards and relieve pressure in that way. But what they, they both did is they broke up play an awful lot and they gave Ashley Young something to worry about going the other way, uh, which he didn't really have at the, in the first 20 minutes. That's what they gave us, Chris, in my opinion. Anyway, that's what I saw. Yeah, and I like and the just the changing formation, changing the numbers in midfield, it alters the passing lanes that they have been able to exploit for that 20 minute period after the half where they were in the ascendancy and they were getting at us, sort of thing. So I mean, even though they didn't as individuals, because I also did have it written down, it was on 76 minutes that Elliot just a terrible clearance gives the ball away and Robble comes in, you know, late to clear the ball out at the back stick. Just fantastic defending from Robertson, switched on the whole game. 78 minutes, two more substitutes. Bacetic and Joe Gomez come on for Trenton Hendo. At this point, Villa hadn't made a single sub yet. Emery was holding his uh, holding his fire, keeping his powder dry. Didn't really help him out too much because shortly thereafter, Gomez, I mean, it's kind of a hit and hope over the top ball. Darwin, poor first touch. And that ball, for 99 out of 100 players in the Premier League, that ball goes out for a goal kick. Yeah. And that's where, and this is where pace comes into it because Darwin has the pace, the quickness, the acceleration to keep that ball in play, force Olsen to palm it back into the middle. And then the touch, the yeah. touch from Useful an touch. 18 year old making his Premier League debut on the pitch for 90 seconds at, at the most, you know, keepers rushing out at him. He's got all the time in the world as he's, sprinting up from midfield onto a ball that's bouncing free in the in their penalty box and just a little touch to take the keeper right out of it left foot slots it home through Dini's leg or through Esri Kanza's legs I think it was 3-1 what a goal the composure to have that thought in his brain because that is something that you can't coach that's something that you either have or you don't at that age anyway and the fact that bear in mind he was a center back you know what I mean He's a centre back in youth in youth football all the way through. He's only be basically been playing in midfield this year, and for him to come in and do that, when I guarantee you his instructions coming on for Henderson would have been right. Joe Gomez is going to be there. You're going to be there, and you two lock up that right hand side and do a job. That's all you have to do. And there he goes, ball over the top from Joe Gomez, and here he is on his bike. He's like, yeah, 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 I'm going to get there. And he gets there and takes that touch, bang, that's a moment. That's a moment that's going to be played down the years because this I, this kid could be special. He really could. He's He's got a, such a footballing brain. He reminds me of watching him on the ball and some of the composure after that in his passing. Amazing. You could see a, You could see the influence Thiago is having on him. You know, that composure to to just look and to be like a lighthouse in the way he, he scans scans the pitch, looking for options. Man, this kid could be a proper player. He really could. Yeah. It's that that I'm so happy you mentioned that Tiago thing, because that's something that I've been harping on for months. Was I and I think it's I think Harvey Elliott is gonna be a beneficiary from that. I think Fabi, Fabio Carvalho is gonna be a beneficiary from that because there's not a lot of players that play the game like Thiago plays the game. No. So even though, you know, I don't think anybody's expecting that we've got some sort of Thiago regen, but if you can just pick up a few of those things, the way that he does those body swerves and just the ability to let the ball just roll and you not touch it to open up that extra little bit of space. Like, yeah, the composure from a kid when, you know, you're three, one up to not just lump the ball out of play, you know, to not just boot it, to just take that extra touch to put his foot on the ball and recycle it and play the short pass and try to keep us going again. I mean, it was great. I mean, yeah. it was certainly easier than his last time out for us. You know, you're not <laughs> going to have a, uh, you're not going to have a much tougher time than going up against the Kevin De Bruyne powered Manchester city midfield, you know, when they've got players, you know, kind of rested up nice and their legs are full of energy and stuff like that. Cause I didn't think he was very good against city. I didn't think it was terrible, no, he wasn't. but he looked, he looked like a kid. He looked like a kid. Yeah. And to be yeah. fair, the midfield that he was up against is as good a midfield as you'll see in world football. Yeah. You know, full, yeah, now, full now, stop. Now, 
now that Modric, Cruz, and Casemiro is no longer a thing going, that that might be about as good as you get with Rodri again yeah. and Kevin De Bruyne flying around in there. Like, exactly. and so this this looked like, you know, sink or swim. His parents threw him in in the deep end of the pool, and he thrashed about a bit, but he didn't drown. He didn't and now drown. he's going back out for his second swim and going. All right, this is a little bit easier. He can feel the ground underneath his feet. So. I mean, I think that's that does a world of good for his development and his yeah. confidence. Like, I, I have a tough time seeing him going back down to the unders. I think. Oh he's God, no! Gonna be, no, he's yeah. going to be around the first team squad now, for good. Exactly. But for for as then, long as he's at Liverpool, he he will yeah. be with the senior squad. Yeah, and then you had the last change to come on. Three-one. Uh, ben Doe comes on, and first thing he does is run at someone. <laughs> <laughs> well, he absolutely sent Luca Dean to the shops for the echo with that. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. I was like, I our Kennedy turned around to me and said, Dad, you you're talking like you're he's your son or something. Because I was like, go on, son, go on, son. I, I was trying to explain to her that is a 35 million pound defender he's just made look like a clown. Yeah. And Luca Dean is always he's been on the fringes of the France France squad. He's not a Muppet. You know, just because he played for Everton, he's not a Muppet. He's a decent, solid fullback. And that one dummy and the pace to get away. And then he sees the Tyrone Miggs coming across, England International. So right, I'll have you two. And he goes and wins a corner. And I'm like, yes. I was just absolute yes. You know, delighted yeah. for him. And that's what that's all you want for him. Someone coming on like that, just do something. Make make some kind of an impact that one you take minutes out of the clock. You know, great. You know that's what you're there for, really. In essence, you're there to take minutes out of the clock. But at the same time, show that you belong, and he did. He showed how he belonged. It, another one. You just want to see good things happen for him, and I, I would. I'd hate. The worry at the start of the game was I looked at the bench and thought I wouldn't want to depend on these guys if we're two one down with twenty minutes to go. Yeah, but and that's not their fault. It's just a situation that we're in at the minute. But at three one up, you think, okay, come on for ten minutes at the end and kill the game off. Great, absolutely delighted for him. And he and he had a couple of other moments as well in the in in that finishing ten minutes where he looked like, yeah. There's there's so much to come from him, and he's he's not overawed. He's he wants the ball, and you know, the more he the more time he spends around the first team, the more confident he gets. The stronger he physically gets as well, you know, as he gets older and he develops into his skin. Um, you know, you're you're talking maybe four or five years down the line when this kid is in his early twenties. You look at Trent where he is now. Trent is twenty four, and from here on, we're going to really start seeing the best of Trent. This kid has got another six years yep. before he gets, you know, before he gets to Trent's age. I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when you when you look at Trent in those first appearances he was making, yeah. and you you put that picture side by side with what his frame looks like now and how he's filled out as yeah. a man and fully matured and everything yeah. like that. I mean, and we're gonna need Bendo. I mean, at least until Bobby Firmino is back, you know, up to match speed, he's the first kind of change off the ranks. You know, maybe Fabio Carvalho who. You know, we didn't see today. We need to have that player there. And he plays in a position. And, you know, thankfully, we've got enough flexibility amongst our forward options that, you know, you could see Chamberlain play right wing if you wanted to put Darwin out left and Mo through the middle. So when Dope came on, Mo went through the middle. We've got a little bit of flexibility there. So it allows us to put him on in a position that isn't massively critical to the structure and shape of the team defensively. You know, it's not going to it's not going to open us up, you know, to the potential of throwing away a two goal lead. Like, you know, he comes on with three minutes left in the game before injury time is added on. And the game was over there. Like, it's not like you're bringing a kid on at the, at the number six or at center half or something like that, where you like go, Oh boy, but he's going to get minutes in the next couple of games. You know, he's yeah. going to be that fifth substitute and he's going to, he's going to see it. And, you know, I think he'll, he'll go back down. I think he's going to go once yeah. we get players back, once Diaz, once Jada, once Bobby are back, He's going to go back down to the unders and he's going to keep banging in goals in the youth champions league. But the time he spent here will do nothing but a world of good for him. 
Yep, absolutely delighted for him. I mean, it finishes 3-1. Um, in truth, for the second half performance, if Villa got something out of the game, I don't think you'd be sat here arguing much. Nope. They played re- they played really well, and they'll beat plenty of sides playing that playing like they played today. They'll pick up plenty of points. They'll play worse and get wins than they did today. But we that win is vital, vital for us. Puts us five points behind Spurs with the game in hand. It keeps us in the mix because Brighton have gone above us today with the with their win. So you know, from here on in now, wins it's just chalking off wins. From here on in, yep. And every three points that we that we pick up, only go, it's it's all it's all we can do, win games. Exactly. See where yep. see where see where we end up. Yeah, we just need to keep stacking results up and get it to the point where all of a sudden you get teams like Arsenal and Tottenham and United and Chelsea going, oh shit, they've caught up to us. You know, like I thought we had a ten point lead on Liverpool two months ago, and you yeah. know, well they're dilly dallying around, and I I mean, Spurs look dreadful. Until they yeah, came jump. back, like they just eventually that balloon is going to pop. Eventually, oh, there's going to be a game where instead of scoring two goals to come back, they're going to give up two or three on the counter and they're going to end up losing four or five now and they're going to deserve yeah. it. But I mean, yeah, the only thing that matters right now is that Spurs are ahead of us, they drop points, and we capitalize because the last time this happened, you know, we're off losing to Leeds and fucking Nottingham Forest and stuff like that yeah. and squandering the opportunity. So we, we can't afford to mess about anymore. I, yeah, I've just seen that as well. Uh, yeah. One thing I will say, and I was surprised. Uh, credit, look, I don't like giving this particular one credit. Paul Tierney was very good today. The um, ref, uh, yeah, no, no bookings, and it wasn't that kind of game. It no. wasn't a dirty game. There was no harsh, nasty tackles or anything like that. But I thought he refereed the game pretty well. And uh, he let he let it flow when it needed to flow. He peeled up fouls when he when he when he needed to. Didn't really get involved too much. Calmed down when it need, needed calming down, and didn't start trying to hand out bookings left, right, and center. I thought he handled the game really well. So I'll slate him to high heaven when they <laughs> mess up. But yeah. thought today did it, I thought today he 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 did okay. Well, it's that's it's his, certainly that's better his, than that's it. It's as Sorry, high as the praise say, comes, and it's it's yeah, better than... Yeah, that's as good as it gets from me. Yeah, it it's as good as it should get from just about anybody because the state of refereeing is just terrible. And, I mean, we you can't possibly be doomed enough to draw David Coote two games in a row. So Spurs got to deal with him this morning and just absolutely, absolutely terrible. So, okay. yeah. Who would you have as your man of the match? If you're going to... Because I think you can man. pick man, man of the half easy. But if you're picking man of the match. I think mostly because it's for sentiment and hope, I would give it to Fabinho. I really like the way Fabinho played because he's so instrumental to us. You know, he might not actually because of the stats or anything like that. I certainly don't think that it was Darwin Nunez. You know, I saw that Amazon gave him man of the match. I don't think it was Darwin, but I really like the way that Fabinho played because he looked like the old Fabinho. He was popping up in positions that we need him to pop up in, and that's we're going to need that going forward. Yeah. What about you? For uh, Andy Robertson. Uh, yeah. So he's, the energy he showed in the first half and the nous and experience he showed in the second half. Um, yeah, I, I'd have given it to Robbo. I thought Virgil played well. Matip grew into the game. Uh, he was shaky in the first 20 minutes, but grew into it. Yeah, second um, half he dealt with Watkins a lot better. I, th- I, that's something I definitely noticed. Was it? That's Watkins a hell of a like shout. Just seen that, that from there. Jonathan there. Yeah, that Fabinho yeah. ran more than anyone today. I mean, that's kind of unlike Fabinho. I wouldn't expect that from him, especially considering the number of fucking empty runs that Robertson was making down the left wing. I yeah, yeah. It's I was, Robbo's, I, a, Robbo's a great show. Yeah, I. I would. I just thought Robertson was really good, but I wouldn't argue too hard. Fabinho was excellent. Henderson was very good as well in the first half while he was on the pitch. Yeah. Uh, there was yeah. one ball over the top. You know those loopy balls that he played that, that nobody likes. Ball. Yeah, but he does. He did play one down the line for Mo to run onto, and it was so close. It was just so close. Yeah. Um, but again, we. Even though Villa were always in the game, we were we played really well in, in good 
patches of that game. Came into it for about 20 minutes in the second half. But overall, I thought we deserved the three points. And it is onwards and upwards now. Four more days, we go again. Yeah, that's I right. And I mean, we go up against... We're next uh, out we, the got we got Leicester next. And I mean, Leicester were shocking in that first yeah, half well, today. I didn't really watch so much of the second half because that game was done and dusted by halftime. But yeah. in the first half, they were poor. Like, what are Marty's doing for that first goal for the penalty? It's just... Well, one thing's for certain. They won't be that bad when it comes to Anfield. They never are. No, no, I'm uh, fully expecting Danny Ward to put in a... Uh, highlight reel tape for the Yashin award, you know, for yeah. his game against us, you know, pull an absolute worldie out of the bag and yeah. play top probably, level, but probably rested Madison as well for his swan song Leicester appearance. Yeah. To, for to, big to money move to, to Newcastle. Yeah. Yeah. So that's going to be on the certainly. cards for sure. I, Newcastle looks like they've got a pretty good thing going on right there. I don't know why you'd fuck around with it, you know? If I was them, I think, I'd be, I'd be, I'd be keeping my dollars in my pocket for through January because they look, they look a good, don't proper they? team, yeah, a proper team. Yeah, look, I said this before that this is their best chance that they'll have for a while, in nearly down a top four spot, purely and simply because they're not in Europe. I think that's huge. That's another shout, Laszlo. We could sack Brendan for the second time. I, with so many managers good managers out of work at the minute it wouldn't be the it wouldn't be surprising is matters got a knee injury so mm, that'd be interesting I, I honestly just thought he was he was just wasn't quite right to, after the world cup so if they're managing injuries for him vardy will almost certainly play um barnes will play but they brought on ioc perez in that one, and you thought, yeah, they, they looked down to the bare bones. Tillemans looks like a shadow of the player he was at the start of the season. So, oh, I uh, I saved this from earlier from Abo the third. Just a big shout out to Wolves today. Merry Christmas, Everton. <laughs> it was it was absolutely lovely. I think that's about as good a note to end on uh, as we could possibly have there. You yeah. got anything else, Kev? No, that's it, man. I think I look. I don't know what's going on for the week. Um, I don't know what shows, if any. I think Gavin, Chris are doing a history show on the twenty eighth. Oh, yeah. So yeah, that's right. Wednesday. Keep an eye out for that. Yeah, keep an eye out for that one. I think we're there's going to be post match, obviously, for the Leicester game. Might try. There might be a preview of that one as well. Coming uh, maybe the 29th, We'll see. But just listen, this time of year, especially when all the days are mashed into one. Just make sure your bell icon is on. Make sure you follow what the notifications on social media. Any shows coming up will get blasted out on Twitter and in the Telegram app. And that's how you find out. But, yeah, please like, subscribe, share it as much as you can. But hit the bell icon as well. And that way you'll know what's coming and when. Yeah, precisely. Yeah, yeah. Ask everybody here to just hit the uh, the old thumbs up button on the way out. But like Kev says, if you keep that notification bell on, you're never going to miss a show. And the best part about the LFC Day Trippers, they're all free. Everything's free. We bring this all to you out of the kindness of Gab's little heart. So that's just about enough for us tonight. Thanks for joining us on uh, Full Time Reds. We'll see you guys around. Adios.